Happy Sabbath, everyone. How many of you already feel blessed by being here so far? You, you just, you're overwhelmed. I know I am, especially by that prayer. I was wondering, did he see my topic today? <laughs> he was um, just right on point with my topic. Um, Zechariah 4, 6, as Kieko read it for us so gracefully. Then he answered and spake unto me, saying, This is the word of the Lord unto Zerubbabel, saying, Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, said the Lord of hosts. And Ellen G. White, she says, Human power and human might did not establish the church of God, and neither can they destroy it. Not on the rock of human strength, but on Christ Jesus, the rock of ages, was the church founded. Ready to serve is our topic. Let's pray. Father God, we just thank you again. You have been so gracious to each and every one of us here today. Now, Father, it is time for us to reciprocate. It is time for us to do that which you have called us to do. It is time for us, Lord, to receive the power of the Holy Spirit and go out in confidence to seek those who are lost, to seek those who are in darkness, just as you have called us out, Lord. May we go boldly and may we fulfill your request to go out and preach and tell others what you have done for us and the light in which we live by and the love which you so smother us with, Lord. And we are so joyful, we are so grateful for all that you have done. Now, Father, bring us your word. I pray that as I speak, that your people don't hear me. They do not even see me. But they see the voice. They see your son Jesus and his voice. Lord, I thank you. And may the Holy Spirit guide me every step of the way. Please allow me to decrease that you will increase. In your most precious son, Jesus' name, amen. You know, our church has embarked on an on a evangelistic theme alongside with the Japanese church, which is being sponsored by our union conference. And they call this TMI. Do you know what that stands for? Total Membership involvement, not too much information, but total membership involvement. And that means that we all can do something. It is not a sit and get. It is not come here every Sabbath, hear the word, eat a good lunch, go home, come back the following Sabbath and do it again. That is not our calling. Do you all know what your calling is by the God Almighty? Do you know what your purpose is? Hmm. The question for us to think about today is, are you ready to answer the call from God to do the work in his harvesting? We have a job to do. We're supposed to go out and preach the gospel. We're supposed to tell others about the love of Christ, what he has shown us to other people, and bring them to his fold. 
we are going to be held accountable. And you know, we really need to examine the reason why we come to church and worship. You see, we are disciples of the almighty living God. And as disciples, we follow Christ. We are led by his example. Just like our forefathers, the disciples of Christ, when you look at their great accomplishments in the organizing and leading of the new church after Christ ascended, you may feel a little bit unsuited for the title. But I want to take a few minutes and just talk about the disciples and the things that they did. They were able to heal the sick, raise the dead, speak in tongues, cause the lame to walk. They had power over unclean spirits and casting out evil spirits, and they baptized thousands. You have that same power. I have that same power. Where are those people? The disciples in the early days, they truly turned this world upside down. And we can do the same. But for some reason, the power that the apostles had or the disciples had, we don't seem to possess. And I wonder, why? Why aren't we moving like the disciples were moving? God is still the same. The Holy Spirit is still the same, and God is waiting to bestow upon each and every one of us the power of the Holy Spirit so we can be about our Father's business. When you look at the, the, the disciples, they're no different than you and me. You have Simon Peter, impulsive, impulsive. An, an impulsive person will do something without even thinking. They will jump right in, may not even have on the right proper tire to jump right in, but they're going to jump right in because of the impulsivity. And then you have my two favorites. The Zebedees, the, the Zebedee brothers, James and John, oh my goodness, short-tempered, ambitious, and judgmental. They were called the sons of thunder. Would you like to be called the sons and daughters of thunder? Because when I hear thunder, it kind of frightens me. But that's what they were called, the sons of thunder. They were revengeful. They had a spirit of criticism, and they were combative. Sounds like anybody we know. Hmm. Now, Andrew, he was eager to please and bring people to Jesus. Philip questioned everything. He doubted everything. Have you met people like that? Bartholomew, honest and straightforward. Matthew Levi, he was a tax collector, so by nature, people did not like him. Kind of like the IRS, want to take all your money from you, and he was stuck with that stigma of uh, just being a very dishonest career. Thomas, Thomas, you may know him as Doubting Thomas, true-hearted, yet timid and fearful and mostly doubtful. Just doubted everything. If I can't see it, I'm not going to believe it. But that's not what God wants us to do. Now, James was strong. He had a very strong character. Uh, Thaddeus was a zealot. I didn't know Thaddeus was a zealot. And I'm like, well, what's a zealot? Well, a zealot is a person who is fanatical and uncompromising in, in the pursuit of their religion, political, or other ideologies. Uncompromising. They will fight you tooth and nail just to prove a point. Simon the Zealot, 
We know he was a zealot. He was uncompromising too. He was a hater of the authority of Rome. Impulsive. And we all know Judas was treacherous, mean spirit and greedy. He betrayed Jesus. Do those traits remind you of anybody? Hmm. The disciples, they were extremely different in character, temperament, and ideology. They had serious faults, just like we do. They all had an, an inherited and cultivated tendency to do evil, just like us. But through Christ, they learned to become one in faith, one in doctrine, and one in spirit, just like we have to. You see, when Jesus chose the, the followers, when he chooses his followers, he's not looking for people with wealth or social economic status or highly educated. He's looking for real people who will love him and who will do his bidding. And you, you see the characteristics of these men. Doubters, zealous, impulsive. But God found a way because they were willing to be changed by the love of God. And they were willing to reflect his character in return to tell others about him. Are we communicating that message today? The disciples... They were ordinary men who accomplished extraordinary achievements through the power of the almighty Holy Spirit. God gave each of them a power to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that they asked or thought, according to the power that worketh in them. The power that worketh in them. Ephesians 3.20. And what I find most amazing about the disciples is that before they were converted, <laughs> before the Holy Spirit was poured out on the day of Pentecost, if we go to Matthew 10.1, Christ gave them the power against unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all matter of sickness and all matter of diseases before before they were converted. The zealot, the evil tempered men, the impulsive one, the doubters. What does that tell you about us? What are we doing? Hmm. We too can have that same power. We can have it. The same Holy Spirit power Jesus gave to our forefathers, he is willing to give to us. But the question is, are you ready and willing to receive the Holy Spirit? Look around you. Look at our church. We have empty pews. We have empty seats. Everyone has in PCS. Everyone has not gone to Taiwan. Everyone is not on vacation. We have people here on this island that don't come back to our church. Why? What happened? Did anyone contact them just to see how they're doing? And we say... Like Cain told God, when Cain killed his brother, God asked him, where's your brother? Now, I was really surprised at Cain's response because I thought it was a little sarcastic. He says, um, am I my brother's keeper? I said, oh, snap. He said that to God? He did. But to answer his questions emphatically, yes. You are your brother's keeper. Ellen G. White states in the Gospel Worker, page 92, Yea, thou art thy brother's keeper. Thou should have had a watchful care for thy brother. Be interested 
in his welfare and, and cherish a kind, loving spirit toward them. Do we do that today to the people in our church? Do we have a kind and loving spirit toward them? Or do we just say, hey, how you doing? And we run off and eat and we leave. Are we invested in the people of God here in this church? But yet we are expecting this, this great evangelistic program to bring people in and we can't keep the people who are already here. How do you think God feels about that? Do you think he can send more people here? I'm just, I'm just wondering. The people who visit our church, who come in here, should know that there is a presence of the Holy Spirit. They should know that we care for them and we're going to welcome them here. But sometimes we as Christians, we kind of get caught up in the logistics of being in church. Oh, who's preaching today? Okay. Uh, who's singing? Which praise team is it? Is it that one or is it that one? Oh, and the special music. Now, if Roxanne is here, I'm going to listen because, you know, she, she can sing. Oh, those kids, eh, you know, I don't know who's singing. It just depends on who's singing, who's preaching, who's playing the piano, which will determine whether or not I will come to church. I don't think that's our purpose for coming to church. Hmm. You know, uh, one day... I was in North Carolina visiting a friend, and she um, graciously agreed to come to church with me. And um, we got our little Google Maps out, and it said it took about 30 minutes to get there, but it took a little longer. So we were fashionably late, really, really late. And the church was you know, kind of crowded. Uh, I had never been to this church. She'd never been to the church. So, of course, there are some apprehensions when entering a new church. You, you're not knowing what to expect, if the people were received you or not. But you know, this is an Adventist church. Adventists love people. So they're going to embrace us. I was excited. So my friend took the lead, and I followed her. And she was looking for a seat, and she stopped by. She says, is this taken? Yes, the seat is taken. Oh, okay. So she walked around, and... She found another place. Is this taken? Yes, it's taken. Now, now, I've never been there. She's never been there. They've never seen our faces before. But the seat is taken. So she said she's going to try one more time. And graciously enough, the people allowed us to sit there. Now, I was embarrassed because these are my people. I'm, I'm bragging about the seven day Adventists, the, the kind heartedness, how loving they are. And she comes to church, can't get a seat. Can't get a seat. So instead of her coming to the church to hear a blessing or maybe hear a word from the Lord that may change her life, she's fixated on, man, these people didn't give up a seat for me. I ain't never been here before, and I ain't never coming back. Oh, and she didn't go back. She didn't go back. But that was such a humiliating experience for me and my church, my people. At that particular time, I was embarrassed to say, I am a Seventh-day Adventist Christian. True disciples of Christ would have openly embraced new faces at the church. They would go out of their way to ensure that the visitors are being taken care of. If I'm sitting here and my husband decides to get up for a minute, oh, so sad, too bad. Yes, please come and sit. Sit. And if I have to get up, I will get up. But, oh, no, we, uh, we ain't going to talk about the pews without the names on them, but don't sit in her seat because that's Sister So-and-So's seat. I don't think we have that here, at least not intentionally. So as I mentioned before, the disciples, they had this precarious background, but yet the Holy Spirit 
was allowed to transfer their characters into the likeness of Christ and the disciples reflected Christ and they continue to work for Christ, preach for Christ, heal for Christ and remove all evil spirits in the name of Christ and ultimately they were able to die for Christ. They died. They gave up their lives for Christ. Look at the book of martyrs. And it wasn't pretty. They were able to die. Because they received the power from the Holy Spirit. And then I would ask you the question today. Are you ready to die for Christ today? And I know without the power of the Holy Spirit, we can't do anything. Hmm. But yet that same power that the disciples had is available to us today. We can have that power of the Holy Spirit and we could get up and say, yes, I will die for Christ today. And it's not you that's talking. That's the Holy Spirit that is in you that is talking. Because of yourself, you cannot do anything. But through the power of the Holy Spirit, you can do everything. But for some reason, I don't think we as a people believe that. We're so afraid of what our bosses are going to do if we come to church on the Sabbath. We are so afraid of what people are going to think about us if I walk out my house with my Bible in my hand. We are so afraid if I go out to a restaurant and I don't eat meat that I'm going to look different from them and they're going to talk about me. But the, the beauty of, of people who are talking about you, as one pastor says, where it counts, where people are talking about you, they're not talking about you. They're praising you for standing up, for honoring God and taking care of his temple and saying no to the boss when he says, I need you to come in and work on the Sabbath or I need you to come Friday night. And you said, no, sir. No, sir. I can't do that. And I know they have these articles or whatever that it can send you up. But the thing is, if God be for you, who can be against you? And until we realize that the Holy Spirit is working on our side, that he is there for us to transfer our characters into the character of Christ and to live and go boldly and preach what God wants us to do until we realize that power, we will continue to be afraid to speak up for our God. And we will not receive the power of the Holy Spirit. Hmm. You know, it's not easy being a, a disciple of Christ. I, I know it. It's not because of myself. I can't do it. Because I have to come and worship. I have to come and worship. Because the word says, forsake not the assembly of Christ. So when the doors are open, I need to be here in worship with the saints. Hmm. I was at prayer meeting. I was at prayer meeting Wednesday. I was there. Can the other five people raise their hand? You know, we are living in the last days. There's no doubt about it. No, no doubt. And if you think we're not, if you think uh, United States and Korea, they're just passing around good words, you know, and, and they just joking. And China's already said, I'm back in Korea. And Russia just sitting back there waiting to say, okay, how this is going to play out? If you think that what's going on now is not serious, you best to think again. Because we are living in the last days. And you are going to have to make a stand. And you cannot make that stand without the Holy Spirit. And if you have not made a stand to stand up for the Holy Spirit, when it comes time to make that stand, to stand up for the Holy Spirit, you're not going to do it. Because you've never stepped out on faith to try the Holy Spirit. So we have to come and worship. Psalms 96.9 says, Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. 
fear, fear, not be afraid, but reverence before him and all the earth. And he says, we must know that we are a child of God and Christ dwells in us. How many of you can stand up and say with confidence that God dwells within me today, right now? I know he resides in me because the things that I used to do, I don't do. And the things that I want to do, I don't do. It is not me. It is Christ who liveth in me. Can you say that boldly today? 1 John 5, 13 says, These things I have written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. And then, as disciples of Christ, we need to walk in the fullness and power of the Holy Spirit. You know, as I was preparing for this lesson, I had to realize that all this power is out there, and I just need to ask God to fill me with the Holy Spirit every day. Every day. Are we asking God to fill us with his Holy Spirit, to lead us, to direct us, to guide us, to control the words that we say, to control how we interact with people? Because you can say that I'm going to do it, but sometimes you find yourself slipping. But with the Holy Spirit, he's not going to allow you to slip if you surrender totally to him. Galatians 5.22, because when the, when the power of the Holy Spirit is in you, you produce the fruits of the Spirit. Do you know what the nine fruits of the spirits are? Love, peace, joy, long-suffering, faith, gentleness, joy, I think I said that, goodness, meekness, temperance, temperance, faith, gentleness, goodness, long-suffering. These are some of the characteristics that you will display through the power of the Holy Spirit. And as a disciple of Christ, you must demonstrate love for God, love for your neighbor, love for your fellow disciples, your, your church folks, and also love for your enemies. I'm sure we can do the first three. It's that enemies that's going to snag us a little bit. But through the power of the Holy Spirit, he can also show you and teach you how to love your enemies. Mark 12, 30. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind and with all thy strength. This is the first commandment. And the second is like, namely this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. There is no other commandment greater than those two. If you find that you have ought with somebody, you need to pray. You need to pray and ask God to help you fix this. Don't try to do it on your own power because you're still going to be waiting. Ask God, please send me the Holy Spirit. Let me make this right. And even if the person doesn't receive it, you have done your part. You are showing them love. But like I said, it is hard to love your enemies, especially if they're persecuting you, especially if they're trying to get you fired, especially if they're slandering your name, especially if they're doing things to you that you have not even given them cause to do. It is hard to love someone who is trying to hurt you. But then as a disciple, we are supposed to read, study, memorize, and meditate on the word of God so we can store up his truths in our heart 
so we won't be deceived and, and move with every wind of doctrine. Second Timothy 2.15 says, Approve unto God a study to show thyself workmen that needeth not to be ashamed rightly dividing the word of truth. Do you know what rightly dividing the word of truth means? Anybody? Do you know what it means? Rightly dividing the truth. Rightly dividing the truth means interpreting the scriptures correctly. You're not going to say this over here that is in opposition to something in another book. So in order to know what you're saying, you have to read, you have to study, you have to meditate on the word of God. This is what disciples do. This is what God did when he came, Jesus did when he came as our role model. And as disciples, we are supposed to, as men and women, pray. Pray. You know, for me, it is a sin to leave the house without praying. If I'm in my car, Lord, please grant me traveling mercies. Do you know how many close calls I've had just trying to get out of my garage or turning up the street? We live in an area that has this winding road. And one day I was on my way to work and it's a hill and this guy, was coming down the hill, and you know it's a steep hill, and you can do some damage if you if you like speed. And he had his ten speed, twelve speed, I don't know, bike. He was coming, and I'm I'm watching him, and he's now wiggling. <laughs> Bam! That guy fell right in front of me, and I know he was hurt. So you know I backed up a little bit. And I go out to try to talk to him with my non-Japanese speaking self, but I did the best I could. And then another guy behind me, he comes, he says, did you hit him? Did you hit him? I'm like, no, I didn't hit him. <laughs> Why, what, would that be the first thing out of his mouth? Did you hit him? No, I didn't hit him. And then a Japanese guy came, and he was able to talk to him and, and take care of him. This was not even five minutes out from my house. We need the Holy Spirit. So, oh, it's 1 Thessalonians 7, 5.17 says, pray without ceasing. When I go to work, I know I'm going to be doing a lot of praying. When I'm in conferences, I know I'm going to be doing a lot of praying. When I'm in church, I know I got to do a lot of praying. And also, as disciples, we have to learn to trust God in our lives and have a life of faith. Hebrews 11.6, what does that say? Hebrews 11.6, anybody know what that says? It is impossible to please God without faith. You can't be a doubting Thomas. You have to have faith. And when I get up, I can't say, oh, I woke up this morning, I'm feeling good. No, Lord, I thank you for waking me up this morning. I thank you for what you have already have in store for me today. I thank you. And I'm stepping out on faith that everything's going to work out in your favor. I'm stepping out on faith. I'm trusting you, God. I'm trusting you, Lord, that you're going to take care of my son and my, my daughters in uh, the States. I'm trusting you because there's nothing I can do. I'm trusting you, Lord. I have to step out on faith. I can't go to bed at night worrying about my family that's thousands of miles away. I can't do that. But I can say, Lord, in your hands, I give you my children. Please. Let them hear that small, still voice of the Holy Spirit. I'm stepping out on faith that he's trying to reach them. And as disciples, we have to understand God's grace, his love for us. 1 John 4, 19, we love him. Why do we love him? 
because he first loved us. But then here's the one that I think we get kind of hung up with, because the first nine, you know, we're working toward it. We're working toward the first nine. But it's this tenth one that we're kind of struggling with a little bit. We have to be witnesses for Christ as a way of life. Not because the church is having a TMI, total membership involvement. Now I need to go out and knock on doors or walking around and praying. You know, I'm going to do this for a season. No. It says it's a way of life. Matthew 5, 16, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father, which is in heaven. Do you fit the description of a disciple today? It's overwhelming. I, I know it is. But through the power of the Holy Spirit, we too can experience the joy of serving and worshiping the Lord in the beauty of his holiness. You see, Christ has promised the gift of the Holy Spirit to the church, us, us. And the promise belongs to us as much as it did the disciples in Christ's time. But like many promises, the gift of the Holy Spirit is provided with conditions, Oh, is there a condition for me receiving the Holy Spirit? Yes. Yes. You see, the Holy Spirit can work in his people to will and to do of his good pleasure in Philippians 2.13. But how many of us, that means you have to submit to the Holy Spirit. You have to decrease so the Holy Spirit can fill you with his presence. But how many of us want to lose control of our lives and, and depend on the, Holy, on the Holy Spirit? We want to manage our own lives. We want to be the drivers of our car. We want to lead. We want to put the Holy Spirit over here. And then when times get rough, here, 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 you take over. You take over. As opposed to let me lead. Let me follow where you lead me. I'm going to trust you with my life. I'm going to submit to your will. So, so just think about this for a moment. God will take us as we are. And you know how you are. I know how I am, so you know how you are. And he will educate us for his service, just like he did the disciples, if we only yield ourselves to him we just have to allow him to fill us with his spirit and have the power of the holy spirit to do what god wants us to do the guidance of the holy spirit will guide our minds and make us devoted completely to god how many of you sincerely want to be devoted to God and everything that you say and everything that you do, you want that to reflect God. How many of you want that? Some people have to think about that. Because like, okay, I know where I work. I know that those people are crazy. And they're going to laugh at me. I don't know. But when you allow the Holy Spirit to fill you, you develop strength to comprehend and to fulfill the requirements of God. Because you can't do it on your own. And then your, your, your weak and vacillating character becomes changed to one of strength and steadfastness. When I say weak and vacillating, oh, today I'm going to go to church. No, no, I may not because I, I have nothing to wear. Or, you know, I'm going to give the Bible. So, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm, I'm going to wait. The Holy Spirit will strengthen you. And he will continue to establish a close relationship 
with you in Jesus, which will then enable you to have those characteristics of the fruits of the Spirit. But you have to empty yourself of yourself. You have to cast out every false god of your soul and withdraw from the conformity of the world. Well, Sister Jackson, what does that look like? You know, I come to church every now and then I go to prayer meeting, I study my lesson. Hmm. You need to stop watching. You need to stop reading. And you start, need to stop listening to those entertainments that do not glorify Christ. You need to stop. You know, Christ is coming. And, and whether or not we are ready when he comes, he's coming. And he's looking for a spirit-filled people, and he's looking for a spirit-filled church. He can keep going until he finds it, but it would be such a waste. We also probably need to get off those computer games and start studying the Word of God. And then it says, we must shun all appearance of evil. And I, I didn't quite understand what that meant. Because I, I could be talking to somebody or I, I, I could be going to a place helping somebody, but it may give them the appearance that, that I'm doing something wrong. So I said, well, it can't be that. It can't be that. So I found this passage, 2 Timothy 3, 1 to 5. And it says, This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own selves. Covetous. I said, covetous? It says, yeah, money lovers. Hmm. Bolsters. Proud. Blasphemers. I said, blasphemers? Yeah, you know, slander God or even man. Have you been slandered before? Anybody here has ever been slandered? Someone said something about you that you knew it wasn't true and it spread it like wildfire? Slandered. Yeah. <laughs> Disobedient to parents. Educators know that. They know that. And then it says, unthankful. Have you met some unthankful people lately? Unthankful? You go out your way to help them. You're not looking for anything. You don't even get a thank you. Unholy. Without natural affection. Truth breakers. What's a truth breaker? Huh? Promise breaker? Or unreconcilable? False accusers? Back to slanders. Incontinent. I said incontinent. I know what I thought it meant. But it's like without self-control. Have you seen people who are out of control? Hmm. Fierce. I said, fierce? He said, yeah. Not tame. Don't respect other people. High-minded. High-minded? Yeah. Blinded by pride. Lovers of pleasures. Those who love themselves. More than lovers of God. Having a form of godliness. What is having a form of godliness? Oh, my sister said, faking. <laughs> Having a form of godliness refers to people who identify themselves with Christians, but are not. She said, yeah. But denying the power thereof. And those last four words says what? From such turn away. And then it says, Take away the confidence we have in ourselves and rely on faith in God to take care of us and sustain us. This is one of my favorite texts. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Do you all know that one? Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all thy heart and lean not unto thy own understanding, but in all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy path. 
He didn't say in some of your ways. He didn't say when you come to church only. He didn't say when you go to work. But he says, in all your ways. That's hard. Because sometimes we don't want to look like Christians. We want to be like Christians. Sometimes. Sometimes I feel I need to tell somebody how they really are. But God says, no. 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 And then it says, we must pray earnestly and diligently to be filled with the Spirit. See, I, I don't understand if we know if our source of strength comes from the Holy Spirit, why don't we have a sense of urgency to pray for that power? To pray for it. Because that's our source of strength. God left so he could come, so I can send my comforter. He's here. He's here with all power, waiting to bestow upon you just for the asking. So I would say in the morning before you get up, you need to set your clocks just a little bit earlier than before and spend your time with God before you start your day. Start your day in devotion and prayer. Praying for your loved ones, praying for yourself, praying for the Holy Spirit. And then it says, confess your sins. That's most important. First John 1, 9. What does that say about your sins? If we confess our sins, he is what? Faithful and just to forgive us our sins and what? And cleanse us of all unrighteousness. So you're praying for the Holy Spirit. You're asking God to forgive you for your sins. And not only is he going to forgive you of your sins, but he's going to cleanse you of all unrighteousness. Why aren't we praying for the Holy Spirit to move us? And then we should humble ourselves before God. James 4.10. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord. And guess what happens when you humble yourself? And he shall lift you up. There's so much power in the Holy Spirit. And all we have to do is just ask, Lord, fill me today. You know what you have to face every day. You know those people you don't like. You know those family members you don't want to call. You know them. But see, God has a way of changing that spirit in you where those people don't bother you anymore. Unless we begin to empty ourselves and take action, the spirit of God can never come in until we prepare the way. And that is submitting yourself to him. Ellen G. White states in the Review and Herald, this is 1887, so this is old, but it's still true. It says, oh, my brethren, will you grieve the Holy Spirit and cause it to depart? Will you shut out the blessed Savior because you are unprepared for his presence? Will you leave souls to perish without the knowledge of the truth because you love your ease too well to bear the burden that Jesus bore for you? Let us awake out of sleep, be sober, be vigilant because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. 1 Peter 5 8. Wake up. Wake up, my brothers and my sisters, for your own sakes. Without the grace of Christ, we can do nothing. 
the scenes of earth histories are fast closing. We are clearly living in the last times. And I know you've heard this forever, but I remember a sermon by E.E. E. Cleveland, and he said three words, scope, frequency, and intensity. Three words. The scope is wider. The frequency is much more, much more frequent. And the intensity is much, much more stronger. Because Christ likened his coming to that of a woman in labor. And as she gets to that, that, that last, I forget what they call it, but they, they break it down into three sessions. And I think it's uh, seven through 10 centimeters where that, that baby got to come out those last centimeters. You start off like this and then you end up like that. It's a very painful thing. Men don't understand, but if you're in there with your wife and she's holding your hand, you're getting a little bit of it. But the intensity at the end of the labor is so intense because it's stretching, it's pulling. That baby's about to come. And that's the worst part of it, kind of like what we're seeing now. We know that we're near the end. And as I said, monitor United States and Korea. China has made their stance who they're standing with. Russia, we're still waiting, but I have a hunch. But Ellen G. White stated in the Testimonies of the Church, Volume 1, page 263, and this one was quite shocking for me. It says, what shall I say to arouse the remnant people of God? I was shown that dreadful scene as before us. Satan and his angels are bringing all their powers to bear upon God's people. He, meaning Satan, knows that if they sleep, if we just sleep a little longer, he is sure of them, meaning their destruction is certain. See, Satan doesn't want you to wake up and realize the power that you have. He wants you to keep doing what you're doing, keep living your lives the way you're doing. He says, just a little bit longer, because he knows that Christ is on the precipice of coming. He knows. It's just a little bit longer. Let me just let them stay asleep just a little bit longer, and I'll have them. But I'm here to tell you, wake up. Now is the time to wake up. Today, give yourself up to the control of the Holy Spirit. Because I know I'm not doing it right. I know I'm not. I can't speak for you. Today, decide that you will pray earnestly with a sense of urgency for the Holy Spirit to take over your life. Set aside the worldly pleasures of today that continues to distract you and me and keep us away from devotion, keep us away from praying, Keep us away from speaking to our friend, our Lord, our Savior, who died for us, who made a way for us, who gave us the plan of salvation, who has given us everything we need to live eternally, and we just sleep it away. Wake up. We need to start hungering and thirsting for the Holy Spirit. For this is the only means by which we will receive that power. Speak of the Holy Spirit. Pray for the Holy Spirit. The Lord is so willing to give the Holy Spirit to those who serve him, then the parents are to give their kids good gifts. And you know you give your kids good gifts. And God wants to do so much more for you. So this morning, this morning, I want to challenge each of you when you arise in the morning, wake up a few minutes early, like an hour. Yeah, I know it's hard because some of us want to be at the gym at 5, which means we're going to have to get up at 3.30. I know, but I guarantee you it will be worth it to spend that one hour in prayer 
and devotion with your Savior, it will change your life. I challenge you. I challenge you to do it. I challenge you to ask God for the Holy Spirit. And I challenge you to surrender completely to the Holy Spirit. You know, you may think this is a little thing, but I'm not back to work yet. And I was at the gym. And um, I know my husband's working. He's working really hard. Uh, and he's encountered a few snags. And it can be frustrating. So while I was at the gym having fun, you know, I love to go to the, the juice bars. I love their peanut butter smoothie. So I was uh, sitting in a car with my peanut butter smoothie. And it was like, you need to take one to your husband. I was like, I only got two. <laughs> but it's like, you need to take one to your husband. Okay, all right. So I'm calling my husband up. Ain't picking up the phone. I'm like, oh, well, maybe this was just me. <laughs> Keep calling. Okay. Kept calling. Hey, Marco, I'm outside. I got something for you. Oh, okay. I'll be right out. Okay. So my husband comes out, and I give him this peanut butter smoothie. He says, you read my mind. <laughs> I said, Really? And, you know, it may seem like an insignificant thing. I didn't have to call my husband. I could have just ignored it, scarfed down those two peanut butter smoothies and would have been happy. <laughs> I would have been, trust me. But my husband was wanting one because he had been at work and he hadn't eaten anything. He had exercised that morning, so he wanted that. And I thank God for telling me, take this one to your husband. Amen. Can y'all say amen? I mean, okay. It was good for me, okay? It was good for me that I listened. It's the small things. It don't have to be something major. It could be just a little something that God tells you to do, and you do it. And when they tell you, hey, I wasn't expecting this, or I needed this, you're like, wow. Thank you, Lord. Listen. Just listen. Hmm. <laughs> you know, I want to ask you guys, how many of you are willing, I, I'm, I'm serious now, how many of you will make an effort this week before you leave your house that you will spend a few moments with God in prayer and devotion how many of you are willing to do that? And I'm telling you, Satan sees your hands. And he's going to say, just touch that snooze button one more time. Snooze one more time. And the next thing you know, you're late for work. Make it a concerted effort. Set that alarm clock. Get up. You have a date with God Almighty, your Savior. The one who died for you while you were still a sinner. The one who wants to infuse you with the power of the Holy Spirit. So you can live that life and claim your promise. How many of you are tired of being down here in this world, watching all the calamities all around us, looking at people who are sick, who are dying, and we're so caught up in what's going on in the politics, we can't see beyond that. How many are just tired of it? And you're like, it's time to go home, Lord. It's time to go home. I want to go. Who wants to go home with me? Stand up if you're ready to go. Because I was talking to the Lord. I said, there's nothing here on this earth for me. It's time to go home. I want to go home. Streets of gold. Ain't got to work no more. There's a mansion that is prepared for me. Not a house. He said, a mansion. Why do you want to stay here? God is waiting for us to ask him to fill us with the Holy Spirit so we can get, so we can go out and spread the news. 
You don't have to be an avid Bible study or know your, your, your text from ear to ear. Allow the Holy Spirit to use you. Just tell somebody about your life. And what Christ has done for you. That's all people want to hear. They, they don't want to hear you quote what Matthew, Mark, Luke, John says. They want to say, well, what, what has God done for you? That is your testimony, what he has done for you. We can only become disciples of Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit. Why will you not pray for the power of the Holy Spirit to overcome our sins and spread the gospel of Christ. This is your duty. And before I close out, you know, every Sabbath we come here and I, I don't know your reason why you come to church. I don't know, and I don't need to know. But if you're not here to glorify God and to lift each other up, then I don't know why you're here. If you're not here to praise God, to give him the glory, to serve him, I don't know why you're here. So I would like to just extend the call to anybody here this moment who would like to have Bible studies, who would like to be considered for baptism. We just saw two of our young people decide to give their life over to Christ. And you know all heaven is rejoicing for those two. And about imagine what he would do if one of us decided, I want to give my life to you, Lord. From this day forward, Lord, I'm going to study. I'm going to pray. I'm going to meditate. I'm going to go out. I'm going to share you with other people because you've been that good in my life. If you want Bible studies, if you want to consider yourself a candidate for the next baptism, please come down front. And I would like for people just to bow your heads and just pray for each person here. Just bow your heads and just pray that the Lord would just bless us. That the Lord will allow each person to reconcile in their hearts that Jesus is the only way. And that Jesus will fill us with his Holy Spirit that would transform our, transform our characters into the likeness of his, that we will be able to do all that which God has ordained us to do. For we know there will be no starless crowns in heaven. And we have to make a concerted effort to surrender to his will. And we need the power of the Holy Spirit to do that. Pray for our people, Lord. Pray for our people. Lord, we thank you. Lord, we love you. Lord, your people here said that they are going to make a concerted effort to begin with you each morning before they leave their house, Lord. Send the Holy Spirit to them each morning, Lord, and remind them of the conviction that they made to you today that they will put you first and show them how to decrease so your Holy Spirit can increase. So when they go out into the world, they can be this light in this dark, dark world. But we need your Holy Spirit. Give us that sense of urgency. For this is not our home as it was prayed. This is not our home. We are traveling through. And we know that what you have prepared for us is so much better than what we have here. So why hold on to it? Show us how to let it go. We need not die for anything here on this earth. We want to live. We want to meet Jesus who died for us. While we were still sinners. Thank you, Lord, for your father. 
Thank you for your Holy Spirit. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you. Amen.